The narrow gauges have always captured the imagination of the railway enthusiast, particularly the two-foot gauge, like here in the roundhouse of the Stadtfold Barn Railway. It's due to the sheer variety in builders, shapes, designs, and applications. In fact, behind me, you can see some of the collection here, all based on the same principle of the steam engine, but looking wildly different. You see, it could be for a, effectively a main line or a quirky little light railway winding its way through the backwaters, or perhaps industrial use being used in mines quarries or around the back of factories. The list of applications is almost endless and as a result locomotive design reflected that with so many different types and arguably far more variation and development in design than was ever applied to the standard gauge. It's why it's such a popular thing, with people giving up their time all around the country to go and volunteer on locomotives. And for many of us, maybe a narrow gauge locomotive is a more appealing prospect to actually own yourself. Although not all of us have the time to be able to travel to a railway and volunteer our time to be part of it, and not all of us can go and buy our own locomotive. So many of us turn to modeling the narrow gauges with the sheer wealth of different types applications being a modeler's dream. So today I'm here at the Stadtfold Barn Railway for the 009 Society show, which is meant to be the biggest and most impressive show of 009 layouts in the country. And as I had a look around at the show before it opened to the public, there was but one question in my mind. What exactly is 009? In its most basic terms, 009 is the running of narrow gauge on 00 scale. So that's four mil scale narrow gauge. And that's most commonly done using N gauge track, which scales up about two foot three. But anything around two foot ish is able to be represented on the 009 running on N gauge, giving a huge variety of different things to model. And particularly of recent years, there's been a resurgence in it with ready to run British outline models coming out, particularly these quarry hunslets from Backman, which look really, really smart. And with that, let's have a quick look at some of the layouts that are on display. Now, as amazing as these layouts looked, I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into why people love 009 so much. And with the full-size engine still being prepped, I went to ask the crew what their thoughts were on 009. Like the randomness of it and the variation you get in the little industry stuff or just colonial and everything else, just very different in every single aspect. And I like to spend money on models. The variety on, on the, on the the set gauge of the track, you know, if you've got things like this beast, which is 20 tons, and you've got a quarry hundred, which is eight, so it's just the sheer difference of things that are available. And, you know, being able to build models of what you drive is also an added bonus. Um, and, yeah, there's such a wide scope of things that they were used for, you know, because gas works, slate quarries, coal mines, you know, and public carriers. So you, there's any aspect of railway modelling you want to do, you can find in the narrow gauge. Uh, and that's what it's all about, really. Yeah. If you join the society, there's a magazine and a wealth of everything else. All the information on pretty much anything you want can be found there. Yeah, even up to the South African garrets and everything else under that scope. Heading inside to look at the exhibition, we started off with Cherry Tree Holt which is set in the autumn of 1948 in a small village based on a fictional railway that served the same quarry as the Leighton Buzzard. <laughs> the 
Next door was Lesu Beng, a completely implausible railway set in the mountains of Lesotho in southern Africa, set somewhere in the 1950s. What was particularly cool about this layout was that it operated on multiple levels, with the upper section employing the use of a switchback to get halfway down the cliff face. Beneath this, though, there was a main line which mostly saw action of the NG16 Garrett pulling long trains at the base of the rock formation. Around the corner was Bottle Kiln Lane. Set in the 1930s, this is a small narrow gauge line running through the English countryside, serving a small canal and a pottery, and featured a variety of rolling stock and trains conjuring images of the quirky light railway. Next to this was Sandy Shores, a completely fictional place set somewhere on the south coast, taking inspiration from places like Dungeness. It's the creator's dream railway scenario, with a converted railway carriage right next door to the railway for them to live in, and despite its small size, there was a whole host of shunting and operational challenges. Retracing our steps took us back to Kievan Bren Carrig, a sandstone quarry in a fictitious area of South Wales. The layout is loosely based around the time of 1968 to the 1980s, showing the last remaining years a steam narrow gauge was used before better road and technology infrastructure came in, and of course appealed to my taste because it was full of diggers and other plants, and also the operator very kindly looked after my camera bag for the day so I didn't go around knocking into people and layouts with it on my back. Yeah, it's really odd. I find it quite interesting to what uh, this morning. If you have lost anything, can you please come to the 09 Society stand and speak to Mr. Julian Webb? Ask for Mr. Webb. As would be expected at a model railway show, several of the major manufacturers were in attendance, including Backman, who'd bought along one of their test layouts and were showing off the double fairies and the Hunslets running around on it. It also had my favourite feature, which was 009 and also 00 gauge, with a pacer shuttling up and down. In my opinion, the show had the perfect balance between model railways and traders, with about 10% traders versus 90% working layouts. That said, there were plenty of gubbins for sale, should you want them. Also well represented were some of the most well-known and beloved of the Narragage Railways, including my friends over at the Corris and the Talaclin, the Welsh Highland and Festiniog Railways, and my new friends over at the Linton and Barnstable. Returning to the layouts was the 9th District, or however that's pronounced in Dutch, which I don't know. This layout is set in a fictional landscape and never was actually intended to be an exhibition layout. 
Most of the engines in use on it were also sound fitted, giving that extra sense of immersion. And there was just so much to look at. One of my favourite features was this wagon that had been shunted too hard and now was teetering on the brink of disaster. The other end of the scale was Slogworth & Co, being only 50 by 35 centimetres long and featured a different scene on both sides of the board. The builder, who was 11 at the time, was the junior winner of the Dave Brewer challenge with this layout. Next stop was Strand, or something in Swedish, which is set in southern Sweden on the shores of Vegavatten in Vastigatland. The layout is freelance, but inspired by the Swedish 60 centimetre gauges that existed until the early 1950s, and represents the terminus of the line where you can see shunting operations being carried out. And one feature I really liked was the moving water crane to be able to refill the tanks of the steam locomotives. The next layout I looked at was this one built by the Dartmoor Modular Group, and as the name suggests, it was made up of a number of modules which depicted the journey from Barnstable to Simon's Bath via Pilton Yard and Hacker's Hill. The thing that I liked most about this was this rather strange rail bus that had been made from cannibalizing a pacer into this strange 009 contraption. I just thought that was very wonderful. The layout was a good length, giving the trains a proper run from end to end and passed through a variety of interesting scenery.
Kun Key, which is one of my favourite names for a layout ever, was another layout that had been built for a 009 Society Challenge, and is based around the well-known Ingle Nook track plan. Jumping once again to the opposite end of the scale, the next layout I looked at was Clare Valley, which featured this absolutely stunning fire duct in the middle. What an outstanding centerpiece. The inspiration for this line was the Bodmin and Wedgwood line, the oldest standard gauge line in Cornwall. In many respects, the model is more reminiscent of the three foot gauge lines in Ireland or the two foot six Welshport and Clan Fair Railway. The stock and the infrastructure reflect this larger narrow gauge outline. And as such, the CVR is designed to be a mainline narrow gauge railway. Taking me straight to the heart of the Welsh mountains was Tanner Lynn, one of the most striking layouts I've ever come across with absolutely draw dropping scenery. It was so good that you could almost believe that you were actually in Wales overlooking a railway like this and how they've managed to do it I, I really don't know because it's absolutely stunning.
There were lots of products being shown off too, like the renowned N-Drive Productions, showing just what their chassis will do, which is actually genuinely very impressive. It means you can fit a decent layout into a tiny, tiny space if that will go around there. And also Westcliff Works was showing off some of their products, like this tattoo based on Stanhope at the Apedale Railway, and our very own Fiji here at the Stackfold Barn Railway, which you can now get as a 3D printed kit. Castle Carignan took me straight back to the Welshpool and Clan Fair Railway, featuring the iconic locomotives of the line and really capturing the essence of the famous Welsh narrow gauge. impressed me was when you saw a photo taken of the track bed and looked down the layout. They are so similar. It really is a model based on the photograph and I thought that was absolutely fantastic. It's not just something that's been made up, it's really based on a photograph that the gentleman who had built the layout had taken of the full size railway back in the day. Continuing the theme of preserve lines was Yer Ellen a imaginary terminus of a branch line somewhere in North Wales which once served a slate quarry but from the closure it's now acting like a tourist railway. Jumping to the Czech-Austrian border was Ostrava, based on the track plan at Kamenice and at Lipo Station on the JHMD network in South Bohemia. The owner of the layout has two stock boxes, one having Czech stock and one having Austrian, so depending on when you come across the layout in the day, you might see an entirely different type of stock. Jumping back to England was Ilfacombe East, a fictional branch set off the Linton and Barnstable Railway. The layout is set in the southern period, but there are a few locomotives still wearing their older LMB colours. And the big feature of the layout is the massive viaduct that runs down the middle. Heading back over to the continent was Kaninchenval. Now this layout was pretty impressive for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was pretty stunning with the scenics. It was based on the Rabbit's Warren principle. That's the train disappears into a tunnel and doesn't necessarily appear out of the next tunnel that you expect and was made up of effectively two loops, meaning that there was a plenty of stuff going on at all times. The thing that was most impressive was the operator wasn't human. This layout was entirely controlled by a computer. All of the movements, all of the points, it just ran on its own. And that is some freaky sci-fi stuff. All of this action, stuff all the time moving, all computer controlled. Now this is completely beyond my comprehension, but I think it is absolutely so very cool. Look at all this stuff, all doing it on its own. There's more action than you could shake a stick at. It's just mental.
back over in Wales was Gaelic Wen, which means white rock. This model is set in Snowdonia in the Victorian period, so around 1880, and represents the modest upper terminus for a passenger working of a former horse tramway, converted to steam about a decade or so previously. Next on our tour was Sud Hart, part of the famous network which has now closed, this bit being in Western Germany during the Cold War and didn't survive into preservation. There are current plans to reopen this section and the layout reimagined what this might be like. This was a slightly different layout as well because this is HOM, 3.5mm scale on 12mm track, so that's running on TT gauge track. And as somebody who has been to the Hearts, this really captured the atmosphere and took me right back to my trip. And whilst we're talking about layouts that are faithfully recreating a real railway in model form, there was this, the Launceston Steam Railway, which again, having visited, I can say that this 100% captures the full spirit of the line and matches my memories of when I was there. You've got your phone anyway. What was particularly nice to see were models of 19B, which currently lives at Stackfold, Fiji and Harriet, which was out today hauling trains. Seeing them in model form just brought the whole event together and showed how appropriate Stackfold was to hold this kind of event. Heading back indoors, we came across Newton Goathorn, set in the winter of 1951 and depicting a clay mining hamlet of Newton, situated on the Goathorn Peninsula in Dorset. Nearby was Woodford, showing just how versatile 009 could be. The whole layout was only 60 by 40 centimeters wide, but boasted plenty of detail. Something that I'd never seen before was Clean Dub Summit. This was the top of a mountain railway, and I loved the way that it drew your eye in down the valley. I just thought this was so very different and so very cool. And apparently to the owner, it's part of a modular system back home where it connects together and makes a much bigger part of the mountain, which was also very cool. A layout that I'd seen before was Colford, and I loved it for its quirkiness and charm. It's based on a real railway in the Forest of Dean, although that was 3 foot 6 and this has been reimagined to be 2 foot gauge. Right. 
once again demonstrating what you could do in a small space was yours or mine. And this used a hidden sector plate to be able to receive and dispense loading and empty wagons at both ends of an ore carrying industrial narrow gauge railway, so that constantly it looked like the loads were being moved about, and I thought that was really cool. I also really enjoyed the trestle bridge at the far end with the abandoned car underneath. Another layout showing what could be achieved in a relatively small space was a Gilderdale mine, which represents what might have been if there had been a mine near Gilderdale Moor, because in the early 1900s there was a great deal of mining activity in the South Tyne Valley. One of the most appropriate layouts to have at the show, as 19B is now based at Statfold, was Kuzon, showing the station about halfway up the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway, at an altitude of some 4,864 feet. The model is a pretty accurate portrayal of the station and surrounding buildings as they existed in the second half of the 20th century. All the buildings were scratch built from card using contemporary photographs, and most of the time the authentic motive power is out. Although when I turned up, they were given the stuff from the Fezzigood run, so we'll assume some grand exchange has gone on. And with the show coming to an end, I managed to catch the last few movements on Turtle Bay, which was really annoying because the last time I saw this layout, I also missed it for most of the day and only got the last few movements. So that's really annoying. But it's a really stunning layout set in the Southern Hemisphere intended to be a showcase for British railways abroad, such as those found in South Africa, Cyprus and India. So that brings us to the end of the day here at the Statfold Barn Railway for the 009 Society's 50th anniversary show. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, it has been the single best show that I've been to, not only this year, but possibly ever. The ratio of models to traders was absolutely spot on. There were traders, but so many amazing models. And the worst thing about the show, and my biggest complaint about it, was everything was just too good. And in fact, everybody was just too nice and I spent so much time meeting some of you wonderful people who are fans of the channel and just chatting to the operators and owners of layouts so I've only actually filmed maybe half of what was here so to everybody that I missed I'm really sorry that I missed your layouts I did see them and I did appreciate them I just didn't film them it's genuinely fantastic and I know that this show has been a once-off as a 50th anniversary special but I really 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 hope that this becomes a regular thing and they do it again because it has been a wonderful atmosphere. Genuinely, absolutely lovely. I've met so many lovely people, had a lovely day and hopefully filmed a video, maybe. So it's been good. And as you can see behind me, they're all keen to go home because everything's been packed up and disassembled. So with that, I guess I should be hitting the road as well. If you have enjoyed this one, how about clicking somewhere here for one of the other model shows we've done here at the Statfile Barn Railway or down there for one of their other special events. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.